Hey everybody, it's Galmadax, and welcome back to some more Magic Green. and today I'll be playing another quick draft of Phyrexia All Will Be One. Without further ado, let's get into our pack one pick one, which is an insanely good pack. We've got the Mythic Rare Elesh Norn Mother Machines here. That's definitely going to be our pick. Just a really fun, really powerful card. A five mana, four, seven Vigilance is already huge. And if we get any good Enter the Battlefield effects, we get to double them all up. So that works with cards like Basilica Shepherd, cards like Chimney Rabble. And one of the major mechanics in the set is Four Mirrodin, which is a mechanic on equipment that make it so when they enter the battlefield, you create a 2-2 Rebel and equip your equipment to it automatically. Now, there's no examples of that in this pack, but there are plenty of those in white and red, and Elish Norn can double those triggers as well to get you two two twos every time you play one of those equipment spells. So a lot of fun things you can do with Elish Norn, and she's definitely the pick. But this pack's incredible, where there's a bunch of other cards I'd be super happy to pack one, pick one. There's a Chimney Rabble here in red, which plays super well in this format. It's got haste, so it gets that aggressive damage in while leaving behind that 1-1 Goblin to leave up your blockers, help you defend while you're slamming your opponent, which is great. Bill you a Skull Dweller is just great stats for only one mana. The Toxic is going to let you start getting poison counters on your opponent to try to proliferate up to 10, or just get them corrupted with three of those early to make any of your cards with the corrupted mechanic better. That's a mechanic that wants your opponents to have three or more poison counters on them. Plus, with the Death Touch, the Skull Dweller makes sure that it stays relevant throughout the game. Never a terrible draw, because it can always block and trade up into whatever you want. So, very solid card there. There's also Tamio's Immobilizer, which is probably the best non Elish Norn card in the pack. The only reason that Immobilizer wouldn't be a slam dunk first pick if Elish Norn weren't in the pack is that blue is the weakest color in the format, but there are still a couple pretty good reasons to play blue, such as really, really powerful cards like Tamio's Immobilizer, which is basically a free ice manipulator locking down a creature four turns in a row with no mana investment after you've hit it onto the board. So great card there. And of course, Basilica Shepherd is great top end for your toxic strategies or really just anything. It's a lot of stats for the mana value. So excellent pack one. But let's scoop on that. Scoop on? Let's scoop up that Elish Norn and move on to pick number two, where we get one of the best uncommons, maybe the literal best uncommon in the format, we get an Evolving Adaptive here. This is a 1-mana one 1-1, one one basically, because it comes with an oil counter and gets plus 1, plus 1 for each oil counter on it. Then, every time you play a creature that is larger than it in power or toughness, you put another oil counter on it. So it basically has the Evolve mechanic back from one of the old uh, Ravnica sets that Simic used to have. So, very fun mechanic, very powerful mechanic where this just keeps growing and growing as the game progresses. And this is a format that also has Proliferate, where you can add additional counters to your permanents. And, I guess technically, with Elesh Norn, when things are entering the battlefield to trigger abilities, we could double up even Evolving Adaptive's ability off of this. So, very, very powerful card. Definitely the pick, even if we didn't have Elish Norn. And it actually is kind of a cute synergy with the Elish Norn. If Adaptive weren't in this pack, this is actually a much weaker pack than our pack one. We'd probably go for, like, Chrome Prowler here, which is a really nice card for the blue-white artifact aggro deck, which is basically the only blue deck in the format that I particularly enjoy. There's a lot of cards in that archetype that trigger when artifacts enter the battlefield, so having one that can come out at instant speed and also manipulate combat by locking down one of your opponent's creatures with a little tap there just plays really well in the blue-white artifact deck, so I do like Chrome Prowler quite a bit, but... Evolving Adaptive is definitely much better. For pick three now, we have a Basilica Shepherd, which is a solid follow-up to an Elesh Norn because of the Enter the Battlefield effect double up. Plus, it's just a good card up front. I wouldn't want to take any cards just because we have Elesh Norn. Like, if the card isn't just already good up front, we don't want to take cards that are only good when we have Elesh Norn on board. So, uh, the Basilica Shepherd is already good without an Elish Norn. It'll just be, like, fantastic if we manage to draw both together, so I think that's a reasonable pick. Charge of the Mites also plays pretty okay, uh, but there's another common removal spell in white that I prefer much, much more. The Planar Disruption is just two mana, 
make a creature unable to attack, block, or use its abilities. Whereas Charge of the Mites is a lot more narrow, you have to have a really wide board state to do enough damage to kill what you want to. But, theoretically, you could also just make some Mites with it. It's not really what you want to do most of the time, though. I think I'm just going to take the Shepherd here. Again, not a super powerful pack. Nothing I even really want to point out as a solid card to keep an eye on. Pack 1, pick 4. Another pretty weak pack. I guess we're just taking another Basilica Shepherd, but this format is aggressive enough that that's basically it for 5 mana spells. There's no way we can take more 5 or 6 mana spells and fit them into our deck in a format this aggressive, so... It's the one awkward part here. Maybe it's even worth just taking like the Blight Belly Rat speculating towards Black White Toxic slash Corrupted as a path to take just so we don't start with three five drop spells, four picks into the draft. Honestly, that doesn't sound terrible. I'll actually take the Blight Belly Rat here, even though it is definitely weaker than the uh, Basilica Shepherd. All right, pick five and the bots have locked us into green for sure. If we can get two of the best uncommon in the format, two evolving adaptive, we're going to have to go in that direction. So we're definitely green, still trying pretty hard to be white because of our Elish Norn, but we'll see how things progress. Pick six now, we do see Eye of Malkator. This is the key piece for the blue-white artifact aggro deck. It is a three mana 4-4, four, four, but it's only a creature if an artifact entered the battlefield under your control this turn. So you need to have a lot of artifacts in your deck, but the really nice thing about it is that it scries two when it hits the board to find those artifacts to, to play alongside it. I don't think I'm taking Chrome Prowler or Eye of Malkator here because Double Evolving Adaptive makes me pretty much feel locked onto that green here. And green blue is really not where I want to be. I think green has the least artifacts out of every color in this set. And the only good stuff in blue, in my opinion, is the artifact-focused uh, archetype. So green-blue just does not work at all. So I don't want to take either of these. So that leaves us with Gold Warden's Helm because of the synergy with Elesh Norn. Uh, complete Devotion, which would probably be better in most green-white decks because both green and white have access to toxic creatures. So this becomes a really nice combat trick when you have a toxic creature on the board. Or we could take Churning Reservoir speculating towards the red-green oil. I do think red-green oil is a super powerful deck, but I don't actually think Churning Reservoir is even that good in the deck. Um, when you have double Evolving Adaptive, it does get a little more interesting, because you're guaranteed to basically be getting a plus one, plus one counter on your board every single turn with this, um, if you've got an Adaptive on the board. But... Uh, the card is still really slow for a format this aggressive, so I don't know about that full speculation here, but double adaptive makes it tempting. So Gold Warden's Helm, Complete Devotion, and Churning Reservoir are the three options. I think they're all pretty equally viable, um, mainly because these two are not that exciting, but Reservoir is pretty narrow. I think I'm still going to take Reservoir here. That seems goofy to me. That seems like it could be a fun time if we get it going. And now we got a really good card to go with that Churning Reservoir. The Incubation Sack is just a good card up front. And the more oil counter synergies you have, the better it becomes. So it's one mana for an artifact and then four mana to start spitting out three threes, which is overcosted for the stat line. You don't really want to play a four mana three three unless you're out of other stuff to do. So this is a very late game spell. But once you run out of cards in hand, the fact that this is a three for one at minimum it's three three threes off of one card is incredible and incubation sack plays very well even with a format this aggressive you just make sure to use it as the last thing you're doing you don't want to spend four mana to play a three three when you could be spending four mana to play like a four three that untaps itself and gets plus one plus one every time it attacks so just keep in mind this is a late game spell not really a one drop that's actually doing anything on turn one but it's a great late game spell Pick 8, kind of sad to see that we could have been like a pretty sweet um, blue-white artifact build here now with a cephalopod sentry, but I am more than happy to just keep taking incredible green oil cards. Now we have an oil gorger troll when we already have two evolving adaptives and an incubation sack, and if we happen to stick to green-white, then this could maybe get doubled up with Elish Norn, but again, it's already good by itself. So we'll take that oil gorger troll. 
pick 9, I suppose we will take the kind of narrow charge of the mites, because there's nothing else we'll be using. Pick 10, take a Trawler Drake here. Green-blue oil nonsense makes a little more sense than green-blue artifacts, but I'd still really rather not be in blue. I don't think Vanish into Eternity is super playable. It does a little bit of work against the red-white for Mirrodin archetype, because it can exile their equipment at instant speed for 3 mana, but... The primary use of this the vast majority of the time is spending 6 mana to exile a creature, which is just a bit too much mana with how quickly games can end. So I'll just take a Trawler Drake. Either pick there's not likely to end up in the deck, but we'll see. Another Charge of Mites, take a Transplant Theorist. At this point, we are at the uh, garbage tier of the packs. There's very few playables, except the double Eye of Malkator in the end. That's a little sad. Well, I mean, we've been getting some really good green stuff. Double Adaptive passed to us, Incubation Sack pretty late, Oil Gorger Troll pretty late. So it's hard to justify a pivot off green. But I have Malkator literally pick 14 and 15, or 13 and 14, however Arena does it. It's certainly tempting. For now, let's just no longer be looking at the mana curve, I guess, and just look at our spells by how many in each color we have, and we have equal amounts of green, white, and blue currently. So for pack two, pick one. Ovika Enigma Goliath is a lot of mana, and it's blue-red, which we're pretty likely not doing that. We've got a Hex Gold Slash if we go to red-green oil with Churning Reservoir and all the green spells. This is a super efficient removal spell, so it is quite a high pick if you're going to end up in that color pair. There's an Indoctrination Attendant, and I do have four white spells already, so getting a fifth is pretty nice. A couple pretty good synergies for this. The main one is with four Mirrodin Equipment, which we don't have any yet, but also with just Enter the Battlefield effects generally, which we're already drafting a decent amount of with Elish Norn. Picking up something with an Enter the Battlefield effect and recasting, it's kind of tempting. Yeah, I mean, I really don't love the idea of ending up in green-white here, but we've seen very, very few reasons to be in red. And plenty of reasons to be in white, plenty to be in green. So I guess Indoctrination Attended it is over the Hex Gold Slash. That's the main competition for me, I think. I guess we could always take Ruthless Predation, which is an okay little fight spell here. The only issue with these kind of fight spells is you don't really want to cast them when your opponent has a bunch of open mana, because if they bounce your creature in response or they play their own removal spell in response, they're killing your combat. Sorry, not your combat trick. They're killing your removal spell and your creature at the same time, which is devastating. They're just blanking your removal and killing a card. Never, never a good feeling, but any time that your opponent is tapped out, which happens kind of a lot in this format because everybody's just curving out, um, then it's super solid removal. Maybe it is Predation. I do think I'm more likely to be green than any other color, because sure, I've got four white spells, but two of them are Charge of the Mites. That's not a ton of those. And then, again, in blue, it's basically just double Eye of Malkator for really solid playables. Transplant Theorists would be good in a deck with Eye of Malkators, but Trawler and Drake, not really. So... Yeah, we are deeper into green when it comes to actually good spells than anything else, so let's grab the Predation. And for pack 2, pick 2, we can stick to that green with a Contagious Vorak here. Excellent, excellent card. 3 mana for a 3-3 three, three that draws a land out of the top 4 cards of your library, or if you don't need a land or you don't find a land, you can Proliferate instead, which is actually pretty gross, with 2 copies of Evolving Adaptive. I don't think it's that unreasonable to... Imagine that we've just played an Adaptive turn 1, and then we just play a Vorak turn 3, and the Adaptive's already a 3-3. Three, three. It gets an Oil Counter for playing the Vorak, and another for Proliferating. Yeah, Contagious Vorak looks really nice here. Other than that, there's a Cultivator, which is great ramp for the Oil-based decks, which certainly looks like where we're at. And some solid white cards with Enter the Battlefield effects to go with Elish Norn, like Indoctrination Attendant, and Bladed Ambassador, but I am very happy to take the Vorak. For pack 2, pick 3, the dream just keeps rolling on in. Now we get an Armored Scrap Gorger towards that green-based oil deck. 
This is a mana dork that also gets some oil counters onto it, and once it has three of them, it turns into a 3-3, so it actually just becomes an actual little beat stick instead of a mana dork later in the game, a relevant body for attacking and blocking with. So I like Scrap Gorger a lot, to the point where I'll take it over Predation here. There's also Furnace Strider and Exuberant Fuseling for really solid cards for a green-red oil deck, but... Scrap Gorger is going to play just as well as those, and we don't have to tie ourselves to a second color yet for that one. For pick four here, we don't have anything exciting. I already have one Basilica Shepherd, and I don't want a ton of five drops. And because I'm definitely playing green, if I'm playing green white, then I already have three five mana spells. We've got Elash, Basilica Shepherd, Oil Gorger Troll, so I don't think another Basilica Shepherd makes the cut there. I guess we could take a Terramorphic Expanse just in case we dirtle around with our second color long enough to want to just do some kind of splashing, but I really generally don't recommend it in this format. It's just that there's really nothing here. There's no good cheap aggro dorks at all, which is the main thing we'd be looking for. Yeah, it's just a bunch of five, six mana spells that are okay, but really slow, so I'll take the Terramorphic. Even though it's not super likely to make the cut. Pick 5 is another super weak pack. This draft has just taken us on a whirlwind of emotions where we've had just some absolute bangers when it comes to the power level of the cards in our packs. Just way too good for, uh, for whatever pick they're at. And then some just truly abysmal packs. Pick 5 seeing these cards, almost no playables really. It's quite disappointing. Complete Devotion only good in... A deck with a ton of toxic creatures, which we are not going to end up being. Shrapnel Slinger's filler for a red deck. Copper Longlegs is filler for a green deck. It's actually a pretty bad filler. I prefer the Shrapnel Slinger quite a lot. As a filler creature. But we know that we're green 100%, so I think I just take Longlegs. Super weak pack. Pick six now, another Oil Gorger Troll. That's very nice. I'll happily take that. If it weren't in the pack, I might speculate towards a Sawblade Scamp or Koldotha Cackler for just a red Oil Dork. But let's grab that Oil Gorger Troll for sure. Here's a Dune Mover for another card that can help splash around. Just puts whatever basic we need on top of our deck. Never exciting, never super good, but nothing in this pack really is. Best spell here is probably Gataxian Wrappers. Raptor or Serum Core Chimera. Don't think we'll be playing a deck that uses either of those. Maybe Green Blue Oil might not be the worst here, taking a bunch of Raptors, but now we get another Incubation Sack, so I'm not taking Raptor over an Incubation Sack. Pick nine now. Very empty stuff. Pick the Cacophony Scamp. I do not like Magmatic Sprinter at, lo at all. I was going to say a lot, but I just don't like it at all. Um, even if you're a dedicated oil deck, the problem is that you're spending three mount on a creature that you then want to keep recasting. Like, it keeps bouncing itself back to your hand, and the oil counters just don't make up for the fact that you're spending so much mana when you could have just spent three mana to get a 3-3 three, three and been done with it. With this, you're spending three mana to poke them once, and then another three mana to poke them again, and then another three mana after that. Unless you put the oil counters on itself, in which case you only have to do the three mana the next time, but then you're not getting any extra oil counter value anyway. Really, really dislike the Magmatic Sprinter. For pack two, pick ten, we get that Cultivator comeback, which is awesome. Maybe we can just go mono green, in which case we can actually play some tap lands without getting super punished. I generally don't recommend them really in this format at all, because everything plays pretty aggressively. Um... So it's hard to find a spot on your curve where you don't want to just play your 3-drop turn 3 or 4-drop turn 4. But if you can find the spot, you do get a little extra piece of card draw off them. So I'll take the Hunter Maze here. They're going to go this late. And we'll see what we get in pack number 3. Alright, so we're green-red. We get an Urabrask Heretic Praetor. This is a 5-mana 4-4 with haste from Streets of New Capenna. They decided to put every Praetor, well, all the most recent Praetors, into this set in the Mythic slot, if you're lucky. 
So this is a card from Streets of New Capenna, but a very powerful one showing up in our pack. 5 mana 4 4 haste that doubles up our card draw by letting us exile the top card of our library and play it every turn. And it doesn't have our opponent's card draw, but it makes it so anything they draw, they have to play the turn they draw it. So it's absolutely devastating against like combat tricks and counter spells and instants like that, but still pretty good in general, making it so your opponent can't just hold on to their spells. Um, like they have to play the removal the turn they draw it, stuff like that. So take an Urbrask here very happily, and we are pushing into red green oil i should say green red oil because green is definitely the core color of the deck with the quantity of green cards we have but uh we have decided our spot well one card has been taken out of this pack one uncommon and there are no playable green or red cards none of these cards i would play in the slightest in a green red oil deck i guess maybe a thrill of possibility but annex century is just astronomically better than the thrill of possibility to the point where i will take that anyway if we see like no playable red spells then i guess there is still a chance we go for the lsh norn deck instead of the urbrask deck so take the annex entry over basically nothing that ends up in the deck pretty hard pick now Pack three, pick three. We've got an Atraxa Skitterfang, which has some really nice flexible abilities for helping you get into combat no matter what's going on. Jump something in the sky, give something Vigilance, Death Touch, or Lifelink. But it's kind of small for its mana cost, and a lot of our creatures just in green are going to be just relatively beefy for the cost, so decent at getting in already. Talking about mainly the Evolving Adaptives, the 3 mana 3 3 Vorax and stuff. So it's not super necessary here, but still pretty great and pretty flexible. I think I would almost just rather take a super beefy threat, though, like a Lattice Blade Mantis, especially because it fits that four drop slot on the curve, which we have zero of right now. I think I am going to take Lattice Blade Mantis over Skitter Fang. I don't think either of these cards will come back, but we'll probably get a Rustvine Cultivator back. Somebody should take Skitter Fang over that. So Lattice Blade Mantis, it shall be. As long as it has oil counters on it, it basically plays like a 4-mana 5-4 Vigilance, which is insanely, insanely under-costed. Alright, pick 4 will get a Skitterfang anyway, and that makes me feel really good about my pick. Because 1 Skitterfang, 1 Mantis is much better than double Skitterfang for this deck, I think. But it would still be nice to have both, and now we do. Take that over Predation Steward mainly. We've got enough uh, little 1-drop creatures to make up for a lower two drop count. Okay, another Lattice Blade Mantis. I will definitely take that over Predation Steward. It's much, much better for its mana cost. The only way that I would take a Predation Steward over the Lattice Blade Mantis would be if I'm astronomically low on two drops or high on four drops, and we're neither. So we'll grab that Lattice Blade Mantis here. Now we've got some options so there's nothing in white but we could take a titanic growth in green as a fine combat trick if we wanted to be committed to the green white deck or if we want to take a red spell here we can take a hazardous blast which is a good finisher because it just shuts off all blocks for the turn and it often kills one or two creatures because of the amount of one toughness cards in the format could also take a Koldotha Cackler, which might be a really big beat stick in this deck because we have a lot of oil sitting around, but I still think I'd rather take Hazardous Blast. If I'm taking a red spell, it's mainly just Hazardous Blast or Titanic Growth is the question. So I think I really just want to see how does the deck just look if we're a white deck? And how does it look if we're a red deck? So we're at 20 playables right now. A little high on the curve, not a lot of interaction, but double charge of the mites can make up for that a little bit. When we look at the red deck, we really just have one removal spell, which is a pretty big issue. Our only removal is a ruthless predation. We don't have any red removal spells. So we're really low on interaction here. If we pick up a hazardous blast, that 
does make up for it a little bit. Not a ton. So it's this and one Hazardous Blast for the green-white deck and one Titanic Growth. I really don't think the Titanic Growth helps the green-white deck all that much. But the Hazardous Blast really, really helps the green-red deck um, solve what it's lacking here. So I'm going to take the Hazardous Blast here, even if we end up getting pushed to green-white in the end. I think it's worth that speculation. Okay, this white card is unplayable for us. This green card doesn't really do anything. So we can take a second Hazardous Blast or a Resistance Sky Warden, which is actually kind of a hard choice. Normally, it'd be super easy to just take a Hazardous Blast because we just don't want this many 5-mana creatures, but we actually have some mana ramp in this deck because we've got uh, Rustvine Cultivator that can ramp up once and Scrap Hoarder that consistently ramps up. And then Contagious Vorak makes sure that we draw an additional land uh, when we don't need to proliferate. So that makes sure that we hit land drops up to that 5 drop slot. I think Sky Warden's like a good enough creature to take over a second Hazardous Blast here. Uh, and it's easily a red spell over a white one there. The white one's just not good. Alright, now actually Thrill of Possibility over a Hunter Maze here. Okay, no white cards at all. Green ones aren't great. Just take a free from flesh. Nice synergy for an oil deck. Absurd combat trick on an evolving adaptive. Give an evolving adaptive plus two plus two and put two plus one plus one counters on it, giving it plus four plus four the turn we play it. We'll take a free from flesh here. Mirror Convert is theoretically good because it is some fixing to maybe play all three of these colors between green, red, and white. Problem is it is a very hard sell to be paying life to do much in a format where everyone's on an aggro deck, pretty much. So take the free from flesh over the mirror convert. Um, not going to play these spells, ideally. Although I guess I need to play something here. I need 23 non-land cards minimum. I, guess I could play a mirror custodian. Have to run some kind of filler in the end. Yeah, play a custodian, I think, over a tiered axe atrocity. Uh, or a second Thrill of Possibility. So let's rare draft this Monument to Perfection. Alright, nothing playable. Nothing playable. We can play double long legs in this deck. But I think we are a 17 land deck with 4 or 5 drops that are pretty solid. And I do think in the end, thanks to the Hazardous Blast plus like Free From Flesh, I like the green-red a little better than the green-white. Not a lot, um, but neither of them are like super, super deep colors for us here. Okay, so... Got a little bit of a drought on the curve around 3 and 4, so it's possible we get some tap lands out there without getting hurt too much. I don't know if I'm running... Three tap lands here. We have four, but we definitely don't want to run four tap lands. All right, first and foremost, what is the one cut? We've got 17 creatures, so it's probably just a non creature. I guess double incubation sack counts as more creatures once we're uh, high up on mana here. Just drop the Custodian in the end. Keep the long legs in. Proliferate is slightly cute in this deck. Still. Yeah, long legs, Dune Mover, and Mirror Custodian are the potential cuts, it looks like. I think it's just going to be the Custodian. And then we just find out what we're doing with our mana. I don't even know how valuable these spheres are going to be, because realistically, like, we're using all our mana up till turn 5 even, and... Even after that, like, I've got four mana abilities on a couple cards, a two mana ability I can keep using, right? Like, if I have an incubation sack on the board, I could use, like, seven plus mana, because I could have an incubation sack on board and then just draw a three drop, and then I want to use my sack and play the three drop when I'm in the late game. So, I don't know if sacking lands to draw their cards is super, super valuable to pay out for the fact that sometimes we don't curve out well with the um, tap land there. So I'm actually just going to run the Terramorphic, but none of the spheres here. 
So I think Terramorphic could still be okay when we have two double reds and two double greens in the mana costs. So we have some pretty restrictive mana values at the top of the curve. So we'll play a single tap land, and I would not be surprised if even with a single tap land we get punished for having tapped mana sources in this deck, but we'll see. We'll go ahead and call it a deck here. All right, here's a look at our final deck list for today. We are on a green-red oil deck. We've got a couple really, really good aggressive creatures, the main ones being the two evolving adaptives here. But we've got some beefy stuff higher up on the curve, like Vorak into Double Mantis, that's pretty nice, and some great card advantage with two Oil Gorger Trolls at Urabrask, and two Incubation Sacks as well for a bunch of good card advantage. So we're like really good at grinding out a long game. We've got several creatures throughout the curve to be blocking the more aggressive strategies. Looks like a pretty solid strategy. One of our big weaknesses here is our lack of removal. We have one Ruthless Predation and one Hazardous Blast, but they are both kind of narrow, especially the Hazardous Blast uh, when it comes to trying to just use this as removal. So if our opponents play any really good bombs, we could have some big issues. But for the general meta, just some random dirty little aggro decks, I think we've got a solid solid game plan so without further ado let's head into the gameplay and see how it does here we are on the play for game one i love the double mantis really don't like having no creatures till turn four though honestly in this format i don't think it would be unreasonable to mulligan this and it might be genuinely the wrong play to keep it yeah I hate that I have to mulligan this, but I really feel like I do. All right, this is a pretty exciting hand. I can't evolve the adaptive for a while, but still has some big spice to it when we hit the late game. Probably ditch the scamp. This is my one drop, my four drop, and five drop. I guess it's not that much better. I've got a one drop here, but we still don't have anything to do turn two or three. Playing against a black deck. Well, there we go. There's what we're doing turn two. Excellent top deck. And now Evolving Adaptive is immediately a one-mana 2-2. We love to see it. There's a Voidwing Hybrid from our opponent. Which is pretty awkward because when they proliferate, they bring it back from their graveyard to their hands. They can keep bringing it back over and over again over time. I could still send in the adaptive, and if they block, I trade the long legs for the hybrid instead. Because um, I could sack the long legs, but I'd rather just get the incubation sack out now so that I know next turn I can play a 3 3 off of that. And by playing a 3 3 off of that, adaptive buffs itself to 3 3, and I can attack in without having to sack the long legs if they block. Uh oh. Fourth mountain before our second forest. I did adjust the mana base. Um after the deck tech today uh, and we are running nine green sources and seven red so just some rough variants on that one we've got five lands and we're hoping to draw a sixth because we are looking for our second green source All right, we haven't hit our second green source, but Lattice Blade Mantis is not horrible as it does evolve the adaptive. Honestly, it's not bad at all. They can't kill either of our attackers unless they double block, so we just send in the team. They might double block adaptive here, but I don't think that's bad for me. Nope, they're just going to chump block it. Fair enough. I was going to say, I think the double block would be fine for me. Because then Adaptive would die, yes, but their Necrosquito would die, which would be nice, because this can get bigger as everything keeps dying on their board. And as they proliferate, and that is what the blue-black archetype is supposed to do. Play a lot of spells that proliferate to keep putting poison counters on us. More oil counters on their board, bring back their void wing hybrid, stuff like that. Another Incubation Sack. Well... It's not my second green source, which is not good. 
Itaxian Raptor is a very good blocker because with the three oil counters, they can block as a 4 1 and already they can just trade into an adaptive or a 5 4 Lattice Blade Mantis, which is pretty gross. So let's just hold up our mana here, and they might try to kill Adaptive with the Raptor, and then we blow it up by using Long Legs here. Uh, but they're probably smart enough to just try to kill the Lattice Blade Mantis with the Raptor, in which case I can't do anything about that. They get the trade. So they want to just keep the raptor around for now. That's fair. Chump block and a bounce. Fair enough. Maybe not. They might actually just trade the raptor for the 3-3 three three instead of the 5-4. That would be super weird. Yeah, I guess they're just playing it safe against a plus one plus one combat trick or something. Or maybe they think by proliferating more oil onto the mantis it gets bigger. I don't know. I think if they were going to trade the, the raptor off, might as well trade it with the mantis. Interesting. Okay. Now... Yeah, we'll just get the incubation sack man investment out of here. And we'll keep using the sack with more oil every turn. That way... Like, this long legs is so dead. There's no universe in which we're not going to proliferate with that if the game keeps going on at this point. So we'll keep using the sacks till they're both at one, and then we might sack the long legs from there. All right, Mesmerizing Dose. They're going to lock down the Mantis, proliferate to pick up the Voidwing hybrid, but the Dose did cost them double blue, so they can't recast the hybrid. Could play a Skitter Fang here, but none of these abilities... Well, Death Touch does work. Yeah, play a Skitter Fang, get Death Touch, hit for three. Seems reasonable. Err. Yeah. Wait, hold up. Maybe I just death touch the adaptive and hit them for four, let that trade there. So they're down to two. We still have a skitter fang for the future. Yeah, because if I death touch this, it probably trades we hit for zero. I think it's alright to let the adaptive go here. All right, they're going to let us keep the adaptive, and they're going to go to one life, then. Cool with me. Ask from there. Very, very little life gain in the format. The one thing we'd be scared of here is there is a 2-mana 1-3 that gains them life every time they proliferate. That's an uncommon, the Scheming Aspirant. All right, well, can't break through all that. We do find the green source for the oil gorger troll, so let's slap that bad boy down. There we go, that's a way to break through that. So we'll just hazardous blast next turn, and that will end the game for us. Cameo is a mobilizer. Very good card, especially in a proliferate deck where it never runs out of oil. But blast, and we're golden. Alright, there's the concession, and we are now 1-0 heading into round 2. Here we are for round 2. Opponents on the play, we've got a turn 2 Scrap Gorger to ramp things out. That'll give us a turn 3 Lattice Blade Mantis if they don't kill it. Which would be incredible. 
Speaking of incredible, our opponent starts with a 2-mana 3-2 with a bunch of bonus abilities that are just all beneficial. They can sack this to clear out an artifact enchantment or proliferate. Green red mirror match it is. They do not have a 3-drop, and I sadly draw evolving adaptive. Which makes things really awkward if I want to get maximum adaptive value. Yeah, we're going to have to let our adaptive sit here and be sad, because I think we got to just go Mantis into Sky Warden. Right, because the alternative is to go adaptive long legs this turn, and then Mantis the turn after Sky Warden to turn after to try to maximize the oil on that thing. I guess it's not horrendous to do that, because this game... Could very well become just a war of attrition. Just who can grind it out the best over time. We can go maximum grindiness that way. But let's just play to the format. The format's generally just full aggro, so let's go full aggro, play our biggest card each turn. Send in the Canker Bloom, no blocks. Play their own Mantis. Mantis for Mantis trade could be a thing. Um, I think if they take the Mantis for Mantis trade, we'll just let it happen here. Because of how good Free From Flesh is on an Evolving Adaptive. Surprised they don't go for the Mantis for Mantis trade, because then I just get to do it on blocks, since the Mantis untaps itself. So the net result is they take five and then the same thing happens. Oh, I see. That definitely explains it. Oil Gorger Troll needed a creature with oil counters on the board uh, to get the full value. So they're at 18, and I could um, use... Well, I could use Hazard's Blast and hit for 10, but that's not going to quite do it. I was thinking I could do Free From Flesh and Hazard's Blast, and then that's 3, 4, 5 more damage. It's still 15, which is not enough. But that would get the uh, Scrap Gorger activated, because we put two oil counters on it. Then when it attacks, it becomes tapped. We exile a card, and then it has three oil, and it's a 3-3. Three, three. So, all right. Not quite Hazard's Blast lethal yet, so let's just... Set up to definitely have Hazardous Blast lethal next turn. Why do they double block Sky Warden here? 4 3 and a 3 4. Probably just find a. Find just a regular place to use free from flesh rather than going for the fancy evolving adaptive. Play. Yeah, if I can use Free From Flesh to kill both these creatures without losing my Sky Warden, then we gotta say sorry to Evolving Adaptive. Alright, now there are cards in graveyards so that the Armored Scrap Gorger can finally start getting its oil counters. There's a Chimney Rabble for our opponent. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9... Well, 9, 10, 11 if we get the full oil on this thing, which is not going to happen right now. Still definitely not Hazard's Blast lethal. Lots of little dorks over there. Well, Hazard's Blast isn't going to be lethal, but I think we still just cast it here. Because now we're killing a Sawblade Scamp and a 1-1 Goblin from their Chimney Rabble. It's, it's pretty gross still. Take four damage on the crackback. There's another chimney rabble. All right. Guess I should have waited one more turn. They've got the mythic common from the format. Which 
Rapinal Slinger hits the board. We don't have any artifacts right now, though, do we? I do not think so. Send in the rabble here. Well, now they've got low enough toughness. We know Sky Warden is going to be a safe attacker, which is great. Ooh, Skitterfang. I kind of want to have access to Longleg's ability without having to tap the Scrap Gorger to do it, so I'm going to play my land here. I can't kill them. I can have a pretty exceptional attack. Just a lifelink up to Sky Warden. Or I could, like, Death Touch the Adaptive. But then I just make it a 3 3 off long legs. They just block with a 1 1 and a 2 2 anyway. But it makes it so they can't block with a 2 2 and a 1 2. I think lifelink is probably the best, though, since we're down to 8. So drain them for five. Trade adaptive one for one for slinger. I guess I could send in two creatures that are theoretically three threes because long legs. Thanks to the life gain. Oh, they're just going to accept defeat here. All right. I was going to say thanks to the the life gain we are really not worried about the crackback we're at 13 they could have blocked see all they needed to do was block two damage to live so they could have blocked just our three three with a one one there and then they crack back for six seven eight nine yeah we're at 13 then we just kill them next turn cool solid solid stuff there we are now two and oh heading into game three Ooh, we find our Urbrask here. We gotta hit some red sources, but I'm gonna greed it up a little bit here. Uh-oh. <laughs> I say that we hit forest number four before mountain number one. We got that adaptive long legs going. Which is nice. Playing against a black-white deck, they have some incredibly efficient removal. So we could have some issues here. Ooh, speaking of incredibly efficient removal, I don't know if predation really counts, but decently uh, efficient removal. Probably kill the Bone Picker Scourge, so even if we get corrupted, we don't have to worry about a life-linking, death-touching flyer ruining our day. Phyrexian Arena. So they are going to have card advantage through the roof here. We just need to outrace it, which would be really easy if we had both our colors. But we might actually just run out of action here. If we don't hit a red source. And Drown an Iker, pretty nice against the adaptive here. Sizer Glider. Alright, I still have solid Lattice Blade Mantis attacks. But I do not have solid draws. Only three red spells left in the deck. And eight red sources in there. Terramorphic and seven mountains. Actually, there's a Scrap Gorger as well, so there's actually nine Dune Mover. There's ten 
10 ways to get a red source. All right, there's Flensing Raptor. Send the Blight Belly Rat into the sky. So we will get our first poison counter here. There's a lot of spells in the black-white color pair that get better when we have three poison counters on us. So now I have two red spells and ten red sources in my deck. Um, I was going to say it might be worth chumping with long legs and just putting another oil counter on the mantis there just to really make sure they can't like proliferate and get us corrupted here because that was also going to be our last opportunity to use the long legs to proliferate another oil on the mantis since we were going to have to use its oil to get another attack in all right works out really well for us that we didn't do that because now we get to keep the mantis against their edict this does mean the raptor gets to get in freely, though. We no longer have a reach creature. Alright, Vorak, we're digging four cards deep off of you. If you don't find a mountain, I'm going to blow a gasket. Alright, Contagious Vorak. Um... Do I do this pre-combat? I guess whatever I play doesn't affect our combat at all anyway, so let's actually just Mantis, and then we'll post-combat Vorak. Because that might get them to... Maybe they just don't block because they want to get the Blight Belly Rat in. They're like, oh, you've got no blockers up. I don't know. They've got a Phyrexian on Arena on board. I really do not think they can choose to go to two here. All right, Shielder's Edict. So they would have just cast that in response to me casting the Vorak anyway. Exact same difference. All right, Vorak. We find a red source. So we definitely cast it. Well, we pick it and we play it. You don't cast lands. Now I can Thrill of Possibility, discard a card, draw two, and look for a second red source for Urabrask. That better than playing a churning reservoir with no cards that care about oil? Definitely. Is that better than playing Cacophony Scamp? Probably. Yeah, I think Thrill of Possibility looks better than Cacophony Scamp here. And we discard the reservoir. Because Hazardous Blast looks premium against an opponent that has a Phyrexian Arena on the board. And Urbrask as well is just always premium. If we can hit the second red, which is part of what we're digging for with the Thrill of Possibility. Alright, here we go. We are officially corrupted. We have three poison counters on us. So any of their spells that have the corrupted mechanic are now incredible. Ooh, hey. That's spicy. Indoctrination intended to pick up a Phyrexian Arena. And then just be like, alright. Never mind. I mean, they could always have a second Indoctrination Attendant somewhere. I don't like that they didn't recast that. They're just blatantly revealing to us that they have instant speed removal or something here. We're halfway through. Still have not found Mountain 2, sadly. So no Urbrask. We definitely don't try to just Hazardous Blast lethal until we have very much overkill because they clearly have instant so let's just put as much power as we can on board which is probably a 3-3 off incubation sack and a cacophony scamp i think that is the most power we're putting on this board okay and then next turn especially if arena sticks around we can Hazardous Blast, and if we hit them with one of our 3-3s, three threes, they're dead. And the only way we wouldn't hit them with one of our 3-3s three threes is if they have two removal spells and they kill both of them. Actually, if Cacophony Scamp hits them, which again, we're going to Hazardous Blast, but if Cacophony Scamp hits them, then um, we hit them for two with that. 
All right, so we need to not die to like the plus two plus one to everybody trick or something here. That'd be one, two, three, four, nine, ten, eleven, twelve damage. It's not lethal on board, but they could have that plus like another combat trick. So I should block at least one card here, but I feel like blocking one creature is probably safe enough. I guess the other threat is that these all have toxic. So if they have four proliferate, we'll die. That does not seem likely. Just do that. Feels safe enough. I could go Cacophony Scamp, and if they play a trick, we ping the face. If they don't, we just ping the rat. All right, we're at five poison now. I probably still should have just pinged the face to make sure one three three would kill them. Oh, come on. Well, now I have to hazardous blast. Yeah. There are some bombs in this format. We found one. Okay, it's a board wipe and a win condition with the mites and most importantly this game, life gain as well. God, that sucks. Where is Mountain 2? <laughs> Not like this, Arena. Of course, I'm referring to Magic Arena, not Phyrexian Arena. When I make my hopes and prayers to Arena. Oh my god. This is an absurd game of Magic. Hey, there's the mountain. We could still win. Not super likely, but we could still win. So I can only give one creature flying anyway, so I don't think I... Long legs... The incubation sack? I guess they would hit the sack and the skitter fang if I did it right now, but... I'm just gonna get the 3-3 three, three here. I don't think additional... 3-3s help a massive amount to where having like one more 3-3 and one less copper long legs changes things much. Because the single 3-3 is already just constantly getting in. I guess they are drawing a lot of cards. Oh my god. And the second Grimnark now gains four because we're empty-handed. Hmm. Play an disruption for the 3 3. We just draw two red sources in a row right after they make us discard a Rebrask. All right. I mean, we basically lose now. Not a whole lot to say. We got hit real bad by the variants. Obviously, at the start of the game. It was self-inflicted a bit. We kept a bit of a risky keep, but uh, we got hit by a multitude of things going incredibly wrong for us. This incredible bomb that also gains life with their Phyrexian Arena. Missing the second red source for infinite turns and the first red source for a very long time. Had our opponent to like 
one life away from dead several times. Now they just have lifelink for Skitterfang. They're not going for lifelink yet, which is nice. Gives us a teeny tiny chance. But I'm at five life, so even if I chump there, block there, I take six. Maybe they won't do it. Yeah, there's the lifelink. And they attack with everybody. Uh, if they didn't attack with everybody, we would still have a shot against the lifelink here, because they could block plus sack to counteract it. But no, that was just super unlucky. Basically, for a variety of reasons throughout that game. Devastating game. Magic Arena hated us in that one, and we are 2-1 and one heading into game 4. Here we are now for game number four. We do have one red source off the Scrap Gorger. Obviously, it'll be a pretty big issue if it's removed. But if not, we probably need to just, like, throw a possibility immediately. Especially if I draw Forest 3. Viral spawning. So if we get corrupted, they get to cast another 3-3. Three, three. They give that spell flashback. So we really want that to not happen, but I can't play anything big enough to block that. Oh wait, no, I can just exile it with Scrap Gorger. What am I talking about? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I really want a Thrill of Possibility over anything else, so I'm going to play Long Legs and Thrill of Possibility here. I think we're ditching Hazardous Blast. But I could also ditch Sky Warden. But I'm technically, as long as Scrap Gorger's on board, only one red source away from the Sky Warden. Okay. Let's get our first poison counter. Boop. Exile the Viral Spawning. Cast the Thrill of Possibility. It's definitely, it's Sky Warden or Hazardous Blast here. It's definitely a red spell that we're ditching. I guess since they have a Convert on board, we'll keep the Hazardous Blast. It'll kill a Convert and get a bunch of damage in. Well, drawn to three red sources in a row. Arena is at least consistent with the jokes. Drop the Oil Gorger Troll, which it'll be rough if they have instant speed removal to kill Scrap Gorger. That would end bad for me, but I think if they could have killed Scrap Gorger, they probably would have done it sooner. Could poke for one there. Not a huge reason not to. Probably should have poked them for one damage. All right, our opponent's already just conceding. They just did not like us exiling their flashback card, I guess. Or State's not that bad for our opponent. They don't know what's in our hand here or anything. They're just over it. So I guess we are three and one now, heading into game number five. Here we are for game five. Third game in a row with that mono green hand. We are all about that life. Contagious Vorak is our answer to finding the red source here. If we do not find a red source, it means there's no red source in the next seven cards, which feels very unlikely with uh, seven Mountains of Terramorphic Expanse that we could hit off of Vorak. 
So eight. Eight red sources that Vorak could find us. Draw the incubation sack, turn two. Just a little awkward. I guess we've got no four drops or anything, so we still play long legs now. I don't know. I could see an argument for dropping the sack now, because then turn four, we just spend four mana and make a three three. But I'm hoping Vorak finds us a red source. And turn four, we can just go like one mana sack and one mana reservoir and two mana predation or something instead. So we find our evolving adaptive, which makes it really tempting to just go adaptive long legs here and then make a sick Vorak next turn that turns the adaptive into a four four. Yeah, that's that is tempting enough for me. I will do it. Playing against a green-black deck, which is definitely all about Toxic, trying to get us up to 10 poison. They've got the Prosthetic Injector. There's the Phyrexian Arena again. And a Draw Skull Bomb for value. We hit land 4. Let's Vorak. There's no red source. Hmm. It's not a natural mountain. I think I am going to decline here and just make a beefy, beefy adaptive. Which could be wrong, but I'm just so tempted to get the double pump from the Vorak that I'm going to do it. Opponent's down to 10 now. Maximizing our damage output does seem pretty nice against a Phyrexian Arena. There's a Drivnod for an 8-3. So, I can't, I have to predation that with Vorak and hit for 4, 5, 6 is the most damage I can do here. They have to exile three creatures from their graveyard to make it indestructible. They only have two cards in the graveyard. Okay, so they can't. They can't make it indestructible. And there's the concession, because we're putting them down to four life, and then Arena puts them down to three, so yeah, they're just going to concede right there, and we are now four and one, heading into round number five. Round number six, I swear. I know numbers. Here we are now for game six. Cultivator into Oil Gorger Troll is pretty sweet. There's definitely a gap in the middle there, which is going to be an issue, but... Whatever we draw into, we'll be doing that. I mean, if it's more red spells, we'll have a problem, but there's only like four or five in here or something. So hopefully not super likely we find more red spells over red sources or green spells. Green sources are not ideal either. Our opponent's starting with a Vat of Rebirth. Which is pretty slow, but it is multiple reanimator spells off the one card over time. If they can keep proliferating onto it or getting artifacts and creatures they control to die, then yeah, this is multiple reanimator spells, which can be spooky, but pretty slow for this format. Our deck's not astronomically fast, and especially our hand is not very fast here, so this could be a game where they get to activate that once. Maybe twice if they've really, really built around it. Alright, there's an incisor glider. Find another red card. Pass the turn. We're going to need this Oil Gorger Troll to find us some gas. One of the really nice things about the Rustvine Cultivator, if they don't kill it, is that as soon as they hit one mountain, it makes sure I get to cast two red spells in one turn because we untap the mountain. Shouldn't have said anything. Opponents wiretapped my house. There is the mountain. 
I haven't drawn into any more creatures, so there's nothing that I can have... Nothing I can put an oil counter on for the Oil Gorger Troll. Luckily, we only take, like, one damage next turn, so I can wait a little bit to play this troll. But it's going to be a massive bummer if I have, if I have to uh, play it without drawing a card. Alright, cool. There we go. Right on time, we find an Atraxa's Skitterfang. And technically, this is pretty bad value to do this. But I'm going to take the action here. So I can use the Reservoir. And get a 1-1 one -one as well. Alright, Whisper the Dross, the 1-1, one -one, fair enough. At least they're proliferating when they don't have an oil counter on the Vata Rebirth. Poke me with the Incisor Glider. Okay. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about the first ability on Churning Reservoir. Alright, it's not bad value at all to just spend the oil to get a 1-1 get a one -one there. So, we cast an Oil Gorger Troll and pray they don't kill Skitterfang... Another situation where it feels like if they could have skilled, killed it, they would have done it sooner. Alright. Oh, it might just be flooding out or something. I don't remember if they played land last turn, though. So maybe not. Okay, Drown and Iker for the Oil Gorger Troll. We are now corrupted, so the Incisor Glider hits us for two a turn, and more importantly, if they get any more creatures, this buffs all their creatures every time it attacks. Plus one, plus one to the whole board, so it can be real scary. They hold it up as a blocker here. I guess because we win the race with Lifelink every turn, since I get the infinite triggers going. Um, I mean, let's just send in with Death Touch and see if they do anything weird. Then I can use Free From Flesh if that helps at all. Probably should not have played this land since I have this Thrill of Possibility. Yeah, I definitely should not have played this land. Just playing a little bit on autopilot. Just rolling through the motions and Phyrexia all will be one. Drop our adaptive. Get our 1-1. One, one. Yeah, we would have had perfect mana. I mean, I couldn't have held up free from flesh and thrill a possibility at the same time, so maybe if they end up trying to like whisper the dross the evolving adaptive, this play ends up working better for us. But I think it would have been better to just thrill. I guess it won't it won't end up working better for us because. If they were going to play something that would make me want to cast Free From Flesh, I could just hold Thrill Possibility to cast it as an instant anyway. Right, so that I can hold Free From Flesh up and then just play Thrill Possibility at the end of their turn. So there was a significantly better line we could have done. Ooh, hello there. Okay. At this point, we ditched the Free From Flesh. Find the second mountain. Oh, I already tapped the red source this turn. There's a head cleaver. Head cleaver is actually very scary. They don't have any instants here, then I'll just predation it post combat, but I want to try to bait out something here. All right. If they could have killed Urbrask during our turn, they would have done it when I declared an attack with them. So now I'll Predation. The reason I didn't pre-combat Predation, even though I would technically hit them for one more damage, is if they could kill Urbrask at instant speed, and I tried to Predation, then they would kill our Urbrask and blank our Predation. So I feel like it's worth it to hit them for one less damage there to test the waters and see if they have the instant speed way to kill Urbrask, because if they did, then they would have done it. 
when I declared the attack. Okay, cool. So, they can only use Vat of Rebirth as a sorcery, and they need four counters on it, so Vat's not doing anything right now, so we just hit with Urbrask again. And then drop Sky Warden. Our evolving adaptive has gotten so big, sitting there pacified, and our opponent probably top decked a land. Wait, why is it revealed to us? They drew for turn, it shows us Blight Belly Rat, and they concede. Why can I see? Oh, right, because Urbrask's ability. Oh my god, my brain is not on today. I'm going to be honest with you all. I had a long, <laughs> long day at work. But uh, we're here. We're playing draft. I'm, I'm going through the motions until Lost Caverns of Ixalan drops. I was really excited for Chromatic Cubes and everything, but they are not coming on till November 7th, I think. So I don't think I'm going to be able to do any chromatic cube videos this time around because on November 7th, I always record my videos at least like one day prior most of the time. So I've already, I don't have time to record a chromatic cube and get it out the day that it launches, right? And November 8th's video, I've already planned to do a set review of Lost Caverns of Ixalan. And then November 9th onward, that's Lost Caverns of Ixalan Early Access, so... It's taken too long with the cube this time around. Every other time, they made it so there was one week of cube before the Early Access event, so big bummer. Big bummer, so that, that is part of why I'm just kind of going through the motions and out of it. In the last few drafts, I'm just bummed out. We should be playing Chromatic Cube right now, but I don't... I don't get to play any Chromatic Cube this season. The Variety Drafter does not get to play a variety of formats this time around. Slam dunk. Insta keep this time around. We have both colors and an Urbrask if we make it to double red. Our opponents on the play with the mulligan to five. Start things off with our reservoir to speed up the scrap cordure. Actually, we already have double red because of the scrap cordure. So... If they don't kill our Scrap Gorger, we won't have to hit a second mountain. There's a Contagious Vorak. Probably get to see what their second color is off of the draw. No. They miss? They have... Oh my god, our opponent is so unlucky. Oh, I should have Termorphic Expansed first. Because then Scrap Gorge would actually exile something and would actually get the oil counter. Loose. Super loose. But our opponent's tremendously unlucky here because they had nothing to proliferate. So they looked at the top four. There was zero reason not to take a land if there was one. So there were just no lands in their top four. All right. We're doing the thing. Oh, an Urbrask against opponent who's stuck on one color could be really, really rude, because if they hit an off-color... Oh my god. I was going to say, if they hit an off-color spell, it's just exiled forever. And they hit a Crawling Chorus, and that leads to the concession. Yeah, that was abysmal luck for our opponent. That was infinitely worse luck than the one game that we lost, which was still a pretty unlucky game. The mole to five mono card hand. Don't hit any lands off the Vorak. Opponent plays an Urbrask to exile your white spell so you don't even get to draw it for later. That was a disgusting game of magic. Not really fair in the slightest. But definitely another victory for this deck. And we are now six and one in the money heading into the final boss with two rounds in the chamber. Here we are for that final battle. No Mana Dork this time around, but another keep, I think. Skitterfang turn 3 is our first play. A little slow for the format, but some powerhouses in the hand with a Sack and an Urbrask. 
Our opponent starts with turn one Cacophony Scamp. We might actually get aggroed out this time. We'll see. Do they have the classic? One drop, two drop, three drop? I think this hand does crumble to one drop, two drop, three drop. They curve out. Oh, yeah. And that's an incredible one, because that combos with the Cacophony Scamp really well. To where if they spend the one mana to put a Batter Fist on it, they can do two damage to any target. So they also can just use it as a shock if they need to. A Sorcery Speed Shock, but a shock nonetheless. Copper Longlegs was a great draw here to make sure we have at least one creature to try to trade off with. Helps us out significantly. There's a Furnace Skull Bomb that doesn't really do anything, and a Dune Mover that doesn't really do anything. Alright. I am now feeling considerably safer. Their turn 3 was much worse than their turn 1 and turn 2. Alright, put a Plains on top with that Dune Mover. They're trying to hit triple white. I don't remember anything that needs triple white, but it has been a while. They've been super in-depth on the format. If I play a Skitter Fang, they can just put a Batter Fist on Scamp and kill it, and then put the Batter Fist back on the 3-1 anyway. Keep beating me down with it. Don't love spending my only removal, but I think it's a much better use of my turn than Skitter Fang is. Alright, crack the Skull Bomb to draw a card. All right, we're chilling. Playing three threes off the incubation sack instead of a skitter fang again, because skitter fang can just get killed by cacophony scamp batter fist. Argentum masticor. Argentum massive problem, more like. It's got first strike, so even with an urbrask, I can't attack into it. And every turn they discard a card and just destroy whatever they want. Card with mana value less than or equal to, so it completely blanks my incubation sack. Because they just discard lands to kill my 3-3s. Three I don't think we can actually beat an Argenta Masticore. I don't even think we have removal in this deck that's big enough to kill it. If I didn't cast Predation, theoretically I could play an Urbrask and then Predation Urbrask to being a 5-6 to shoot it. But that would be my only way to kill it. And obviously I had no idea Argentum Masticor is coming here. Yeah, I think that just blows up blows us up, period. I think we're dead. Might have been better to Urbask there. Uh just hoping they don't have like another five drop to kill it. Just to start the, the card draw going. Get any of your upkeep. Untap upkeep draw. So they have one card in their hand, and whatever it is, they have to discard to keep the Masticore around, and then they do the same next turn, so they just don't play it. Yeah, I think I should have just played Urbrass last turn, but I'll definitely do it now, because now we had them ditch a spell here. Um, and now I actually get damage in with Urbrass. Well, no, they could double block and scamp shoot their Urbrass. Probably have to hold up blockers. Oh my god, hold up. Wait. Urbrask actually nullifies the Masticore. I am playing so sloppy today. It's not... none of No cards go to their hands, so they have to discard. But they have nothing that's actually in their hands, so Masticore does just actually die. Oh my god. Well, they can actually use Autonomous Furnace and keep it around for another turn. Wow, I really should have played Urbrass last turn, shouldn't I? No, don't play the War Whip. Alright, well, Mascore's dead. Oh, hey, Hazardous Blast. So, most of their creatures are dead, too. I guess they put me to one with Cacophony Scamp. 
Vorak is going to be the perfect blocker for their 2-2 double striker. I guess they can turn it into a 3-1 double striker. All right, they're not going to have mass score anymore, but they'll have a 3-1 double striker. So against a 3-1 double striker, I can still double block with Vorak long legs and, and kill it. So let's set that up. They cannot block because of Hazardous Blast, so we'll poke with Urbrask. Let's see what they draw. Oh, Blazing Crescendo? Well, we don't get the double block. I think I do this. I don't think Proliferate's valuable enough to chump with my 3-3 here. Hazardous Blast? No! Alright, well, we need to Skitterfang for lifelink now. Because that's till the end of their next turn, right? Yeah, end of their next turn. So they can Hazardous Blast and Batter Fist and hit us for six. But six is not lethal if we gain life this turn. So Skitterfang, life gain time. Another batter fist? Well, they can't put two batter fists onto the same creature. Because it'll become zero toughness, so that wouldn't change the damage they do. And they tapped out a Hazardous Blast, so now they just don't hit us at all. But that's fair enough, because at this point they know if they just go Hazardous Blast and equip, then uh, I just go to three and then kill them on the crackback anyway. So uh, they block here, three, five, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we have lethal. Go to three, attack with everybody and win is the play. Might as well play this from Exile, but then we'll just get in here. All right. Looks like our deck, and especially Urbrask, is just a busted enough magic card to make up for some really sloppy playing these last couple games. And we're going to get a 7 and 1 run very very nice that is maximum prizes and only one loss all around we will certainly take it and that is going to grant us some pretty big prizes by quick draft standards 950 gems and two extra packs out of the 750 gem event so we are definitely quite far in the money one last look at the deck here there were definitely some things that were awkward about it the curve was not great and the mana's a little rough with these double red spells. I still felt like we had enough green spells to justify going for a 9-7 split, but we did get hit pretty hard with that a few games in a row. A lot of mono green games uh, for a little while there. But, again, we've got that Dune Mover, that uh, Scrap Gorger, and uh, we could always have just mulliganed those opening mono green hands, and, and maybe that would have uh, helped in that that little section of the draft where we had some some mana issues there so yeah the mana base is a little bit rough there's some kind of filler cards like the long legs the dune mover but overall some really premium card quality with adaptives scrap gorger mantises vorax skitter fang oil gorgers there's enough really good creatures and some really good spells like the incubation sacks and the cream of the crop the Urbrask to make up for that and still grant us a nice, clean 7-win run. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.